Hi guys, welcome back to the JPS Podcast and on this episode we have Steve Hall and I'm very excited to be coming to the UK with Lyndon Purcell, my colleague, to present alongside Steve and Pascal this July at Stands Up Fitness in Bath on all things contest prep. We'll also be releasing our ebook, The Ultimate Guide to Contest Prep at the seminar and attendees will get that free along with free access to our online contest prep course. Anyway, guys, in this episode, we talk about the primer phase, peaking for a contest prep, and the mistakes that Steve has made as a coach and an athlete. And I am sure a lot of you guys will get plenty out of this episode, and I hope you enjoy the introduction that will follow this. Without further ado, I present to you Steve Hall. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and on today's episode, we have... Steve Hall from Revive Stronger. Just correct me if I've pronounced that wrong, Steve. <laughs> oh, for fuck's <my> sake. <laughs> it's uh, Steve Hall. <laughs> Steve Hall. And just to give the listeners a little bit of a background about you, Steve. You're a competitive bodybuilder. You're a coach at Revive Stronger. Is there anything else you want to let the listeners know about you and what you've done? Oh dear, I'm terrible at giving banter back. This is like one of my huge weaknesses as a person. I just take it <laughs> and Jacob knows this and so he just can give it and I'm just like, fuck, I can't even do an Australian accent. So uh, that's me on it. On You nailed me, Jacob. <laughs> I didn't even plan that. I, I really didn't. Steve, thank you for coming on the show, man. It's an absolute... Never pleasure. again. <laughs> Never again. I hope not. I hope not. But guys, in all seriousness, uh, Steve is a competitive bodybuilder and he's a coach, uh, a Revive Stronger content creator. And I think he's a very admirable person uh, in the fitness industry for a lot of reasons. Um, but most notably, he's just worked his ass off for many, many years um, and improved his knowledge his education and got a bucket load of experience and uh, he has a lot of useful and uh, valuable insights into all things bodybuilding and that's what we're going to talk about tonight Steve or your day and we're obviously coming over to London me and Lyndon in a month's time to present with you and Pascal on uh, contest prep and we've written an ebook that is almost finished. We're getting very close now, uh, thank God, um, on the ultimate guide to contest prep. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about your topics in the ebook, what you'll be talking about at the seminar, and then I wanted to discuss some of the mistakes you've made as a coach and an athlete uh, in contest prep. So I think it'll be very valuable for anyone who's a, a coach or a competitive physique athlete, or maybe looking to get into the sport uh, to hear what you have to say, because you, like I said, you do have a lot of the knowledge and the experience, which uh, is really cool. So firstly, tell us a little bit about what you wrote uh, in our ebook. You discussed uh, the primer uh, phase, which is basically the you know the prep before the prep kind of thing, um, and you've actually written an ebook that's going to be coming out very shortly on this. And to all those listening, I recommend you get a copy because Steve is the primer king. Talk to us, Steve. What is the primer phase, and why is it important for bodybuilders to prime themselves before a contest prep? Awesome. So yeah, primer phase. The way I've been talking about it recently is I don't know why it just came to my head, and it was kind of like a deload on steroids. It's like whenever someone does a deload and they come out of it, they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so fresh. I feel so good. And uh, primer phase is like an extended deload in some ways. It's not quite a deload like that because that sounds like hell to people. But a lot of bodybuilders and physique competitors don't like the idea of kind of standing still or homeostasis, um, which is unfortunate because it's incredibly good for the body. The body loves homeostasis and it allows a lot of things that are unsettled and stressed to settle. Um, whenever we go through fat loss, whenever we go through hypertrophy, we're seeing a stress build up, even massing in a surplus like that feels fun and nice for us, but that's a stress on the body having to grow and to add tissue to the body. Um, it's very stressful. Same with fat loss. Everyone knows that's inherently stressful. And we see these kind of like adaptations and the body starts to resist growing muscle it starts to show signs of fatigue in that sense where if you're in a like you've been training with high volumes for a long period of time maybe you find you're getting kind of like niggles in your joints the muscles aren't really getting very kind of like good pumps you're just not feeling like things are progressing very well things are getting quite stale likewise in a diet you might be feeling like really drained low testosterone no libido 
hungers through the roof and like fat loss is seemingly at a snail's pace despite being trying to be in a big deficit your kind of neat nonic exercise activity thermogenesis plummeted through the floor even if you're trying to keep steps up whatever you've done you now you're shuffling or something these things you just can't lose fat forever you can't try and gain muscle forever um the body will fight against it and this is what why we take kind of deloads is like when you go through a mesocycle you accumulate fatigue and then you need to dissipate that through kind of taking a, a step back now and then and likewise when you've gone through like a macro cycle of fatigue and you've built up and generated this over a long period of time you see this resistance building up and what a primer phase does is allow that to drop down and in some ways lets you develop and settle at a new settling point we kind of know set points and settling points settling points is kind of like combining genetics with your environment and where your body likes to be and we have an element of fat settling points and also muscle so at the end of kind of uh, muscle gain phases it can be an idea to let that settle at a higher point than diet say or in this case for the primer phase in a contest prep maybe you've done like the diet before the diet like a bit of a cleanup then you've come through and now you're settling down at this new body fat so that you can kind of get your calories to a good point. You can allow a lot of the kind of adaptive resistance that's built up where you've got all this diet fatigue, which is really kind of making life a lot harder than it should be to dissipate. And you are in a prime position to then enter an actual contest prep where you're in a lean position. You're not kind of 20% over stage weight anymore. You're in like a, a nice position where you can start digging into shows but you also feel good. You haven't just finished a really long diet to get where you are. You've just finished an extended period of maintenance. So there's loads of benefits to primer phases. Um, this is why we included the chapter in the ebook because for contest prep, it makes complete sense. And then, yeah, with our ebook that we're uh, releasing, it just goes into even more depth and like answers a lot of questions that people potentially have about them. Um, and actually, since writing it um, with like, we had the whole team looking over it and I wrote it and Pascal kind of edited it it kind of reinforced how great these pe periods of time are. Um, so yeah, it's been really cool. Awesome, man. And what are the primary questions that people have about the primer phase that you uh, covered in your ebook? I think a lot of the things are like misconceptions potentially, like why, like why? And uh, I think the thing is, there is no, um, it's kind of a hypothesis or a theory that this might be something that's beneficial. Um, in terms of it's never been like studied and I don't think it ever will be studied because why would it like it's just not you're not ever going to get a budget to for bodybuilders to do this sort of thing or kind of anyone to do this sort of thing necessarily but we certainly know that these negative adaptations build up from dieting we know they build up through kind of gaining phases um, and we can see in practice and we've kind of had this from like obviously a lot of studies are based off kind of initial bro science and the studies prove whether it's kind of true or not We've heard of like hardening phases before. I think Lyle McDonald's talked about these hardening phases where you kind of let all this fatigue settle. You let yourself kind of hold on to this new mass. And um, I think a lot of people just are like, why can't I just continually push up or down? And I don't think it's a case of you can't, but I think it's a lot less efficient. Uh, I think it's a lot less. Um, I don't think the kind of known results and the staleness um, will be as good as if you were to take these periods of time. So I guess, yeah, people maybe don't know how to train during this period of time. So it's maintenance volumes, lower volumes, so that you kind of let the, the as you train with higher and higher volumes, you see a bit of a kind of switch towards or a, a ratio shift more towards slow twitch muscle fibers which aren't the best for hypertrophying. They don't grow the most. So by going back to lower volumes, removing anything above like 15 reps, you let those kind of pathways resensitize. You kind of find that you can get much more growth from those areas again. Um, you allow a lot of kind of the niggles that build up over a period of time. Like deloads are great for kind of removing a lot of those. But some of these things you can't see, like this micro trauma that's happening to like ligaments and tissues that aren't well kind of innovated with um, nerves and they don't kind of recover very well. So this primer phase, again, being low volume allows you to resensitize those pathways. Loads of physiological rationale behind it and then also psychological. We don't like to think that we ever need that break. But um, I tell you, like after having not had one for like a year now, I'm looking forward to the next one. Like it, it does after a while get overwhelming with the amount of volume that you have to keep pushing and continually eating tons. Um, it's kind of nice to have a almost transition between certain phases. 
So I don't know if I actually answered your question, but um, <laughs> I answered some things I was thinking about. Yeah, no, I think um, you did answer. And I guess what many people fail to realize is that, yeah, we stress a lot of different you know, biological systems when we train, eat at a surplus or diet. It's not just muscle tissue and, you know, fat mass that we're uh, manipulating. You know, it's uh, an immune system, it's our endocrine system, it's our joints, connective tissue, all those sorts of things that often get overlooked. And when you have to sort of sustain a really long contest prep that's a lot of stress, it's probably, you know, a good idea to spend a good chunk of time before you go into that phase, you know, dropping off any residual fatigue. And we often, you know, forget about the allostatic load, which is basically the wear and tear and the cost of adaptation over time. Uh, so if we can drop all that off before we get into a contest prep, uh, I think it just, yeah, primes the body uh, to endure all the stress uh, that's forthcoming in the prep. So no, you didn't answer that. And a, a lot of what you talk about in the ebook is starting from a place of strength. And this was actually, I think it was that you were the first person who actually introduced me into that exact terminology and concept of, uh, you know, contest prep. Like I always knew that it was a good idea to sort of, you know, you want to start your prep with high calories and, you know, you want to be in a good psychological state and, you know, be at a good body fat percentage, enough muscle mass, all those sorts of things. But you, you coined that from what I know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but starting from a place of strength, I give you credit for that one. That was good. Um, so yeah, I actually thought it was from you. So, <laughs> well, there you go. Brilliant. Fuck, we can, we can just blow smoke up each other's ass all night. That's great. Um, Both no. take credit. It's all good. No, I, I think you, uh, you did come up with that one, or if it, I don't know, I might have. <laughs> Who knows? I'll give you. Credit. I should have just taken it. But you I should can't. have just shut up. Now you, now you've made me think twice about. That. No, but you talk about starting from a place of strength, and I think this is one of the most overlooked components of a contest prep. Um, because as we know, it's like people get into bodybuilding generally because they're trying to fill a void in their life or, you know, they've had some hardship or they, they may even have, you know, some body image issues or, you know, uh, mild, you know, eating pathologies and, um, you know, disordered eating behavior and whatnot. Um, and that's why they get into the gym and then it's like, oh, well, bodybuilding will solve my problems. Um, and, and that we know that that can end worse than, what people think um, and starting from a place of strength is like a really good concept to wrap your head around to avoid some of the potential negative consequences um, of competing because it's a pretty extreme sport. So what is a position of strength and why is it important? Cool. So yeah, I mean, you brought up one already, which was calorie intake. Uh, it's a horrible thought when you have someone who's maintaining on like as a male, anything close to 2,500 or below, it's just not very much. And it doesn't give you much room for maneuver moving forward. Um, so nutritionally, just c calories. If you have more to play with, it makes it the process a little easier. You think of someone like Alberto Nunez, it's all relative. Like, sure, he's going to be re feeling really hungry. But if he's eating 2,500 calories and you're eating 1,500, that's 1,000 calories that he can make his life maybe a little bit more livable. So if you can start in a position where you're on just more calories, it'll make the whole process 10 times easier. And then in terms of nutrition also, it's like diet fatigue. Like really I assess like your eating behaviors. It's taken me a long off season to get to a point where like my diet looks bad, like not bad, but it looks like, like I, I'm not eating all these like salads. I'm, ex I'm excited this, to like, come and eat some, uh, <laughs> Some chip butties with you Pizza. in uh, a month's time. Oh, chip butties. <laughs> chip butties. I don't think I've even ever had one. <laughs> well, I'll take you out for your first, Steve. How's that? The Aussie <laughs> taking the uh, the Brit out for a chip butty. <laughs> <laughs> Some fish and chips. Yeah, fish and chips, right? I had that for dinner, actually. It was brilliant. Mm. Uh, so where was I? Yeah, so in terms of like diet fatigue, I think this is a really big one because if you're already starting a contest prep, and you're already relying on like diet hacks. You're already kind of consuming Warden Farms over all your oats and you're already like cooking it 10 times over. That is not a good place to start because where are you going to go from there? You've got nowhere to go. Uh, I think it's a really good idea to be in like a position of starting your diet where you're just not fussed about food, where you're not trying to like volumize things. You are eating out. You are kind of flexible um, so that you can then be a bit tighter going forward. So like you said, I think there's a caloric kind of area there and then also just psychology within that 
And then in terms of like physiology, um, you don't want to be injured. <laughs> you want to be in a place where you are feeling really good. I mean, I've seen people start contest preps injured and it's just, where is that going to go? It's either going to make the injury worse or the person's going to probably sacrifice tissue in that area, depending on how severe the injury is. But again, that's a st place of strength is physiologically, you can go through periods of training that are like good amounts of volume that's going to sustain that tissue. Um, and then in terms of your environment, so having a support network, if you're in a period of maintenance beforehand and your training volume's lower, you can kind of actually secure relationships, uh, make sure that you're kind of you're spending lots of time with your girlfriend and things like this. She doesn't think you're a dick because you're probably eventually going to be a bit like that because it becomes selfish. Um, spending time with like friends, family beforehand, explaining the process, then that also gives you a bit of strength going forward because then they understand kind of what you're going to be doing uh, rather than, yeah, starting on like relationships already at kind of at the end. You don't want to then start a prep because they're, they're likely not to go well. So I think that's the main things in terms of starting from a place of strength is kind of being on a good intake, being rid of diet fatigue and then physiologically being ready to take on higher training volumes and be productive. And then as an aside, your environment surrounding you, um, having work under control, I guess, as an online coach for myself, like I don't want to be starting a new project at like the end of prep. I want to kind of make sure that I've got everything under control. Uh, I'm not taking on maybe too many clients, that sort of thing. It just gives you a period of time where you can prioritize and then set yourself up going forward. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess uh, stemming on from that, um, you know, some of the ideas that we always talk about in a contest prep uh, to come out of the gates fast and this was actually Lyndon's chapter but that's what starting from a position of strength does it allows you to make a lot of progress really really quickly with minimal effort right it's like maximal return minimal effort and I think that's what allows people to sustain you know their, their contest prep if you're exerting a high amount of effort uh, at, at the start of a prep from the onset, it's going to be a really arduous process. And I think, yeah, you summed up a, a lot of the key points there. And uh, for those of you who are coaching or competitors yourself, it's like make sure you start in a place of strength. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very rough. Um, and just a, a question I had for you, Steve, um, was if you have clients uh, or potential clients come to you and you can see that they're not in a position of strength, uh, firstly, how do you identify whether someone is in a position of strength? Do you have questionnaires? You obviously have a chat to them. What are the red flags? And do you often turn clients away um, or recommend that they you know, spend some time building up, getting themselves prepared um, for a contest prep down the track? Excellent question. And yeah, we do it via consultation. Um, and in that consultation, that's where I'm asking questions like, trying to identify their diet fatigue so i will ask like how is your libido this seems a bit kind of uh, like a personal question during a consultation but i will go there um i will ask females like are they regular with their kind of menstrual cycle those sort of elements also like how does their diet currently look how are they feeling in terms of like diet fatigue all of those elements are they in a good place mm -hmm. um, and then asking kind of like when was the last time you dieted and what is your calorie intake right now uh, and kind of what is your body fat percentage right now and then you're kind of looking at, okay, how far away is their show? Is there realistically enough time to diet for that without having to diet for too long? So is it in like the next four or five months? If it is, they need to be pretty lean and in a strong position. If it's kind of within like the next couple of months, they better all rip like, I mean, it's unlikely that I'm going to take them on for that. I really like to get people way ahead of time, um, but I have turned down people. So I've had, um, unfortunately, um, I could, one story that kind of is more apparent in my mind and uh, a female client who came to me, I think a couple of years ago, I'm actually coaching her now, but she came to me a couple of years ago and she was already not having a menstrual cycle. She competed maybe three years back to back and she was looking for me to take her to stage again. And I just was like, I wouldn't take you on if you haven't got your menstrual cycle. I'd want you to have like an extended off season. Um, and it was really hard because well, I am who I am. And unfortunately, like being a nice, I guess, like you can't always be nice. Um, and that was me being nice, I guess, was letting her know that. And now I'm coaching her and it's, she got her menstrual cycle back. She took time off after she competed that time. And now we're kind of trying to get her in a kind of healthy position again. And it's, 
that to me was proof in the pudding of this is the right thing to do as a coach always like if someone isn't if you don't feel comfortable doing what a, a client is asking you like don't do it because they're hopefully learn and she did and she learned maybe a, a bit of a hard way um, after that uh, competition season but that happened so with other people I'll just be realistic with them I'll be like okay so if we do everything right we'll be on target for that show but there might be a period of time where we just decide that instead of entering in another diet phase, we just go into an off season and pick a later show. Um, it can be tough, but it, the worst thing is they're not happy with their stage condition because maybe they're not lean enough or they've had to push too hard and they've sacrificed a load of things and they didn't enjoy the process. And then you as a coach probably don't enjoy doing that either. So it's never, ever worth kind of rushing something that you don't feel comfortable comfortable or confident over doing. Yeah, perfect. I love that. I've had uh, many a hard chat as well with uh, people who want to compete and uh, trying to you know, guide them off the ledge and talk them out of doing something they've already you know, uh, convinced themselves of the right thing to do and something they want to do um, is tough. And I think it shows not only a lot of care for the quality of work you do, uh, which is like the selfish side of that decision, but also a lot of care for the client um, and integrity because it's easy to take people's money and say, yeah, let's put you through a pet prep. You know, and that's unfortunately what a lot of coaches do. So for, for the listeners who have gone to a coach and maybe been turned down, um, you know, that, that's a good thing. It means they care and they're, uh, they're thinking yeah. about your well-being. So that's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, no, fantastic, Steve. And at the London seminar, you're going to be talking about peaking strategies uh, for contest prep. And you did a, a freaking brilliant presentation for our contest prep uh, course, uh, our online course. And I really enjoyed it. And let's talk about oh, that now. <laughs> so um, peak week, it's not really as exciting as what many seem, is it? It's the most important week of your contest prep seriously <laughs> it's, it's almost becoming like a thing now isn't it like peak week for, like everyone's going to start not even bothering about peak week soon aren't they because yeah, it's the becoming pendulum. the like the pendulum is just... yeah it's going to swing the other way <laughs> which is going to be really like unfortunate but it's just that's what happens within the industry but you're, you're right it in terms i always like to look at it like um the muscle and strength pyramids and they kind of have their their pyramid and they have like calories at the bottom macros supplementation at the top i look at peak week as like the supplementation to your contest prep and i would say your off season is oh, like yeah. the most important thing so many people mm -hmm. like we said starting from a position of strength that's your off season that's a building the muscle that's being in a position that's not super dieted then it's your contest prep and then it's like the peak week is literally mm -hmm. like it's probably even less than what supplementation would give you so like you said, it, it's really not the be all and end all. It's literally just a week to put the finishing touches on, like put the cherry on top of the Sunday. Um, because at the start of that week, you should already be looking ready to step on stage. And it's just about just filling out a little bit in terms of muscle glycogen. Uh, it's just making sure that you're not holding on to any subcutaneous water, reducing stress, not providing too many carbohydrates in that week. And then not eating like an idiot and having loads of like sticking to all your high volume foods, all your high fiber foods and uh, having a load of bloating going on. So, yeah, that's that week. Yeah. And you touched on a couple of the, the key variables there in relation to nutrition. So the, the Steve Hall analogy uh, that's used in the book is uh, filling up the cup, um, which is, you know, basically... Okay. The bucket, the bucket, the bucket, sorry. <laughs> you know, I always forget that because I don't ever use a bucket <laughs> ever. So I always forget. <laughs> I know, what do I? <laughs> I should change it to a cup. <laughs> uh, same thing. It's, it's water into a cylinder type uh, object. Um, but no, it, we deplete ourselves in a contest prep. We eat you know, low calories, low carbohydrates, create a deficit. We deplete the muscles of glycogen. That's a byproduct of being in an energy deficit. And we obviously want to achieve a couple of things in a contest prep, which is filling up the bucket, so topping up muscle glycogen, not spilling the bucket over, um, so that'd be eating too much, where we you know, hold additional water that's not within uh, the muscle. And then also just making sure that we don't 
uh, you don't have any bloating or anything like that. So yeah, tell us about how you approach some of the other variables um, outside of carbohydrates, uh, such as water, sodium, um, and food choices in a little bit more detail. Cool. So something I've recently been doing, um, and like there's loads of ways you could go about controlling water and sodium, I think, but something I found to be practically very simple to do as an online coach at least, um, and then I think if you're coaching yourself, you could find ways of doing this yourself. But something I really liked was from about four weeks out, you start monitoring your sodium, added salt, sorry, to your meals. And hopefully you're adding some. If you're not, this is an opportunity to start increasing that by a small amount. Don't go adding like five grams if you've been adding nothing. Um, maybe just sprinkle on a little bit from what you've been doing. And then monitoring your fluid intake. Uh, and then what you would do in that scenario is basically have a diet plan. And this is when I would say it becomes really helpful to just follow the same foods, the same times. And not only does this help in scenarios like this, because you keep your food in a vacuum and therefore the water and sodium content of that food is like acknowledged. And then you've got the water and the, the sodium on top of that, that you're monitoring and you can have a good idea of that. Um, it also is just like stress relieving when you're not playing like a, uh, macro tetris at this point you don't want to do it fucking around that sort of thing you want to pick foods that are sitting well with you and that are doing like what you want and you're focusing on nutrient timing you just tick them off tick the boxes and you can just follow a routine and probably have bland foods when we're thinking about the food palatability reward hypothesis that sort of thing that's another side point but basically you've got your meal plan in a vacuum so your water and sodium via that is staying the same then you're monitoring whatever you're having on top of that and then take an average for that first week and then you can kind of manipulate it if you want to have a bit more and then you can kind of have that and continue you know where your water and sodium is and this is important because you basically want to keep the way i like to approach it at least is to keep this basically level throughout peak week um, i will say and as i talk about in the presentation like if you try and think about this too much you'll drive yourself insane one of my clients was telling me how like when you he looked up some studies like having coffee and that makes you excrete more sodium and should he then make up for that sodium that he's excreting i was just like whoa this is like this is how out of control this can really get and i think i talk about it within the presentation in terms of like environment i remember one of my peak weeks we had like a heat wave over here and i, I was sweating more and i was like if i didn't drink to thirst and i just followed what i'd been having before then i potentially would have been like dehydrated so I always say like find these averages, but then increase a little bit according to like what your body's trying to tell you because the body is great at homeostasis and you're not likely going to be able to trick it. And both water and sodium are incredibly, well, they're absolutely essential for glycogen loading. So you need to have them there at least at the kind of the averages you've been having before. And probably you're going to become more thirsty. You're going to get more sodium through the carbohydrates that you're consuming and loading on. So it kind of plays into itself. So that's what I do with like electrolytes and with water. And if you're doing a rapid backload and you've got less time or even a backload potentially, you might need more control of like potassium. You might have to think about loading on things like potato, sweet potato, Cheerios, I think is another popular one from Cliff Wilson with the rapid backload. Uh, that is more like you need more tight control the shorter period of time that you're loading for. So that's kind of, yeah, where I go with water and sodium. That's where I also go with, I guess, food selection within then peak week. I like them to just upregulate basically the foods they've been having from carbohydrates unless it's like high fiber ones. So probably not loading on loads of potatoes, probably going to cause some bloating and things. Maybe you're having some rice, move towards having rice or rice cakes or a cereal that sits well with you going along that line. Um, and then towards the final days, I like people to start limiting the amount of like fibrous veggies they're having. Just so, like you said, reduce any chance of bloating, make their waist look as small as possible, stick to maybe leafy greens, and even going down to the point of potentially ridding kind of sweeteners. They can sometimes cause a stress response that can cause some element of like bloating or distension within the gut. You might not even be able to notice it. I would always say like if you're having a lot, at least taper them down, or if you are happy to just get rid of them completely. I haven't noticed any like game changing from doing that, but it it's just kind of like, why not? It's just a couple of days not to go without it. So I think I covered most of the nutritional elements. Yeah, no, you did. And just uh, to continue on the discussion of carbohydrates, you mentioned 
the rapid backload or a backload. Um, so for the listeners who might not be familiar with that terminology, that's basically you know bringing your carbs into the diet right before the show. Um, and the rapid backload is basically a very high carbohydrate uh, day prior to uh, the show. And some other methodologies are the, the front load um, and reverse dieting, um, obviously. So, so what is your ideal approach if you had the perfect contest prep how would you go about things and then a spin-off question from that uh, would be what differences does the division and the category that an athlete is competing in uh, make for the type of peaking strategy that you employ cool so yeah for the first question i think ideally and this is like a real ideal situation because it doesn't often happen but it, it can happen if say you've got a qualifier and then you're competing later which is what happened for me in my last contest prep where i did manage the kind of the reverse diet or the, the bodybuilding taper i think i also call it uh, whereby you're already shredded you're pretty much like 95 to like 99 percent of the way there you're going to continue being in a deficit for a little while but you're going to reduce that deficit over the course of maybe a month. Uh, it's probably a decent point to start doing it at. And that's literally just increasing carbohydrates from five to like 20 grams each and every day. So keeping a close eye on the physique and you'll probably find that you start looking leaner because you'll start filling out your glycogen stores a bit more. You'll continue to lose some fat. You potentially even gain some muscle if your like training performance is increasing, which is really cool. So you can also reduce kind of cardio or steps in combination with that because that's just part of the same kind of process you're just burning off glycogen essentially with those so that is like ideal because then you're like by the end of that you're very full very kind of vascular um, and looking peaked like all the time and the only things you really need to manipulate potentially there is maybe you just top yourself off a little bit at the end like just a little bit more carbs towards the final few days and just reduce like i said the the things that are causing potential bloating the sweeteners that's like ideal that's awesome because you also feel great as an athlete there and it's so little stress um, it was really nice being able to do it myself uh, for my latter shows uh, but it like we said it's kind of like ideal doesn't always happen and then in terms of the other question like federation or category um not federation category i guess like we have men's physique we have classic we have bodybuilding we have bikini we have like women's physique women's fitness so it does make a big difference so for like for, for the biggest thing actually before i go into like the differences there maybe a big thing to remember is like stress for the, the athlete i normally find the slower approaches work better so like a front load or um, like a taper of carbohydrates up through the week because you've got more time and it's smaller amounts and they're just like looking a bit better each day uh, miguel really interesting he brought up that some of his female clients get super stressed by that approach and so he back, rapid backloads them like the day before a show which normally you wouldn't do that because that's normally for like a male bodybuilder potentially female bodybuilder who's super lean who really responds well to like a big surplus of uh carbohydrates in a short period of time and they can super compensate and really be kind of reaping the rewards of that so for like a, a bikini like female that's not really making much sense so yeah typically for like bikini you're not looking for like hard like we said we'll be looking for muscular fullness hard uh, abdominal bloating of that it's really just the abdominal bloating we're not necessarily looking for them to be vascular and hard super conditioned in fact you don't want that i've had it where i had a bikini client who actually she started having like quad striations and even glutes in her line uh, lines in her glutes even and i was just like right we're we just carb loaded the shit out of her like Cut so that water. week was quite fun for her <laughs> yeah well yeah you do i don't like messing around with that sort of thing, but um yeah you can soften people up yeah. pretty well if you want to so it's just playing with those variables like you said um, like you can play with the water if you want to you can play with carbohydrates and things um and so i'd start off with like the least stressful approach and then maybe an approach that you've kind of trialed before um, the more extreme approaches the more rapid backloading style approaches are probably more towards more serious leaner individuals who have competed before and then for new time competitors i'd prefer kind of doing it at the start of the week you haven't got as much kind of leeway um, you don't know how they're going to respond as well so that's how i tend to go about things awesome and i guess uh for the listeners an important uh, tip that uh, I know Steve employs with his clients is to use your refeeds and diet breaks throughout the prep 
uh, as practice for your peaking protocol. Um, you know, you should hopefully have refined or at least got an understanding of how somebody's metabolism, you know, responds to various calorie carbohydrate intakes and, you know, fiber amounts, food types, um, you know, with those refeeds and diet breaks. And that should give you a pretty good idea as to, you know, when they look their best after a certain number of high days, for example, um, you know, and what they prefer in terms of uh, food choices, all those sorts of things. So um, use those, um, you know, high days or refeeds, diet breaks um, as practice. Um, but no, great answer, Steve. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was the mistakes you've made as an athlete and as a coach. If there was one mistake that you think is most valuable uh, to anyone listening, um, so there'd be two mistakes, one as an athlete, one as a coach, um, what would they be and why? And how have they helped you, I more importantly? Awesome. So, yeah, the first mistake would be my own. So I never took anyone to stage before I'd already done it myself. And I had, and it's hard to say because at the time, I don't think we were quite as aware of the importance of refeeds, diet breaks, not dieting for so long, step counts, that sort of thing. So I had a coach at the time who took me to stage. And I feel like we made some mistakes and I, I, I eventually made the mistakes myself. Uh, one of the big ones, I guess, that haunts me is... I was just super lazy. Like I didn't even think, I just had no awareness of neat at all. So wherever possible, I'd sit on my ass wherever possible. I would just be, and I was a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer. So if my clients canceled, I was like, fuck yes, I get more time to just lie on the sofa or whatever it might be. So it was really wasn't good. Um, and then what happened as a consequence of that is my calories came really low. I had to do loads of cardio in addition so the, the biggest mistakes, I feel like not having an awareness of NEAT and how big of a role that can play and how much easier you can make your life by just having awareness of it. And then also my prep was really long. I didn't start, I, I started from a place of strength, but I wasn't strong enough to really stay strong throughout the entire prep. I had to lose over 30 pounds for that show, which I mean, that doesn't sound completely out of sorts for people, but I had no diet breaks, I had a few refeeds. So in a, in a scenario now, I'd much prefer to have had 20 pounds to lose with diet breaks included. So those are some big things that I kind of learned. And I'm glad I did it because I never wanted any of my clients to go through such a thing. Um, and I guess one one final one I say mistake um, is I didn't shave my armpits for my first show and I got deducted points <laughs> and I had no idea that you had to shave your armpits. <laughs> so now like I'm big with my clients like, you're, you're shaved, right? <laughs> like you've removed all the hair. Um, so those are some mistakes I made myself. In terms of with clients, the biggest one that I hate making is not having time and not pushing them hard enough. Um, because whenever, like, I don't know, I've had preps with clients and I and like I'd be fine saying it to them and they'd know it as well. Where I, I just wish we had another month. And maybe we underestimated how hard the prep would be on them or how hard we'd have to push initially. Um, and in hindsight, I wish maybe we pushed harder earlier or we had another month to play with. And what that tells me is just take more time than you need and almost always give yourself like another month on top of what you're thinking. Uh, because like we said, if you're ready early, you get to reverse into your show and that's the best position to be in. So now with my clients, I try and start like, and the thing is, no one wants to start as early as what it looks like from the outside because you plan all of your time like digging and with diet breaks in between there, you plan that maintenance, the, the primer phase beforehand, and then you plan all the time before that. And in, when you plan all that out, that's like almost a year like of your life that you're like, shit, I thought I had all this more time gaining muscle. It's like, no, we need to start now and, and don't be silly in like think how much a whole month of extra dieting could get you versus a whole month of muscle gaining. It's a big difference. So, um, yeah, those are the, the biggest mistakes I've made. Um, and the biggest, yeah, or actually all mistakes I've made. <laughs> the only mistake Steve has ever made guys. He's a flawless individual. <laughs> no, Steve, that was really good. And I, um, I appreciate the hair comment because I've had clients too, who have you know come to me, on show day or you know they've gone to their show and I'm like 
I told you to shave it all off. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yes, guys, the little things matter, the cosmetics in the final stages of uh, a prep, especially guys. I don't think we have this issue with females as much as no. we do with the men. Um, but, yeah, any hair, it's got to be gone, especially if you're in the uh, tight little budgie smugglers, as we call them down here in Australia. We no. have budgie smugglers as well. I heard... Uh... James was saying how he loves the term buggy smug budgy smugglers. I think we've also got that here. <laughs> Beautiful. We're not too uh, dissimilar than you and I, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we love a budgy smuggler. You're probably thinking, Jacob, we are nothing alike. <laughs> <laughs> Don't insult me like that. <laughs> no, Steve, thank you so much for your time, man. It was a pleasure as always. Guys, you know where to find Steve. If you know about JPS, you know about Revive Stronger. Get over, follow him, Pascal, Miguel, and Ryan. Support the boys. They do a lot of really good work with the podcast. Their social media content is always on point, very informative and very easy to understand. And support them where you can because they're doing a lot of really good things for the industry. Steve, thank you. And I'll see you very soon, man. Thank you very much, Jacob. And uh, yeah, thank you for the kind words. Uh, you guys are also equally crushing it. And I, I love that we oh, provide you, each man. other. <laughs> I was, was going to say at least we provide each other motivation it's good it's, it's true it's, it's true. not rivalry it's actually I just look, we both I look up to you what you guys are doing and well maybe you look up to some of the things no, we're do. doing <laughs> no I do I think your yeah. infographics have been rocking by the way thank you man I've been I've been trying to up my game um, but uh, no I think competition is a good thing especially if it's healthy competition um, and there's that mutual respect and I, I definitely feel like we have that man so it's uh, a pleasure to be working with you on many projects and uh, yeah, also both striving to help our athletes, help the industry. I think we have a lot of the same same goals. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun and uh, we'll speak to you soon, bro. Thank you, man. Thanks, guys. Awesome.